form is temporary, class is permanent. It's one of the oldest expressions in football, sometimes attributed to former Liverpool manager Bill Shankly, and most commonly invoked when a talented player returns to form following a difficult personal spell. There are many players who are proving that old adage this season, whether that be Marcus Rashford, who has bounced back from the most disappointing season of his career to date by becoming one of the most dangerous forwards on the planet, Antoine Griezmann, who has recovered from a subdued campaign by his own high standards to become one of the best players in La Liga once again, or Granit Xhaka, scolded and written off so many times at Arsenal, but now a key cog in the team that leads the Premier League table. For every player that rises each season though, another one falls. And in today's video, I wanted to take a look at a number of players who were outstanding last season, but have suffered fairly steep falls from grace during the current campaign. I don't just mean the likes of Son Hyung Min, Mason Mount or Jared Bowen, who have dropped off this season compared to last. I'm talking about players like Leon's Moussa Dembele, the score of 22 goals last season, but just three this season, who have fallen off the edge of a cliff, smashing faced first against every verge on their way down, and landing in a massive cactus field. Without further ado then, who did suffer an incredibly steep fall from grace, just not this season, here are seven footballers who have suffered steep declines this season. Seventh, Richarlison. When Tottenham signed Richarlison last summer for a fee of at least £50 million, pounds, plus a further £10 million pounds in potential future add-ons, it was seen as a statement of intent. Antonio Conte already had an excellent front three of Son, Kane and Kulisevsky, but now he would have a proven Premier League asset and Brazil's number nine to bring off the bench and to keep the other three on their toes. In reality, what has actually happened is that Son has been a shadow of the player that he was last season when he was tied with Mohamed Salah for the Premier League golden boot. Kulisevsky's numbers in particular in terms of goals have dried up and Richarlison has been almost invisible, failing to score a single Premier League goal. Only the indomitable Harry Kane has maintained his standards. Though I'm not sure that he's worth the fees that either Everton or Tottenham paid for him, I quite like Richarlison, and I made a video defending him from some pretty deranged criticism after he did a few keepy uppies against Nottingham Forest at the beginning of this season. One thing that's unusual about Richarlison's difficulties at Tottenham, which are so severe that his own manager basically said that he has been rubbish this season last week, and for what it's worth, he didn't say it nearly as nicely as I just did, is that it has come at a time when he has been in the form of his life with Brazil. Richarlison scored 10 goals in 10 games for Brazil in 2022, including a stunning overhead kick against Serbia at the World Cup. That is precisely 10 more goals than he has scored in the Premier League this season, in a Tottenham team that is still just about hanging on to a spot in the top four, having scored 10 in an Everton side that only narrowly avoided relegation last season. It's not just Richarlison's numbers which have been uncharacteristically abysmal though, it's also his all-round performances. Typically so bullish, aggressive, and involved in games even when he isn't perhaps producing within the final third, this season Richarlison has been far too passive, seemingly struggling with not being an eld on starter every week, and failing to make a mark with cameo appearances off the bench. It is worth reiterating, despite him having been around for what feels like a while now, that Richarlison is still only 25, and a new Tottenham manager, which one suspects we will see sooner rather than later, may view him more favourably than Conte. If not, it might not be long until he's on the move once again. Sixth, Andrea Bellotti. Long-term subscribers to this channel will be well aware that I have long been a fan of Andrea Bellotti, who was the main man at Torino for seven seasons before joining Roma last summer. A great athlete with a phenomenal work ethic and no lack of goal-scoring prowess, it seemed like a brilliant piece of business. 
Jose Mourinho has an impressive track record, working with strong talismanic centre forwards, capable of leading a line. He would complement the already considerable attacking talents of Tammy Abraham at Roma, and he is as tried and tested as they come in Syria. Unfortunately, as with Richarlison, that isn't quite the way in which it has worked out. As early in the season as September, Mourinho joked in a press conference that Bellotti had, quote, a disease which prevented him from scoring goals. Mourinho was actually alluding to Bellotti's unselfishness, describing him as having a playmaker's disease and always looking to score the perfect goal rather than just being in the right place at the right time and scoring by any means necessary. But if his ambition was to inspire Bellotti to turn that around, well, it hasn't worked. Bellotti has now played 22 games in Serie A this season without scoring a single goal, with all four of his goals in 34 games in total this season, having come in various cup competitions. Bellotti didn't seem to be suffering from any such diseases when he scored 28 goals in the 2016-17 season, or 113 goals in 251 games for Torino in total, and he was still the Turin club's top scorer, in the league last season. Bellotti isn't alone though. Mourinho's men have struggled to score goals all season and are the lowest scorers out of the current top eight sides in Syria. A measly 35 goals in total from 27 games is not befitting of a side which boasts the likes of Bellotti, Paolo Dybala, and Tammy Abraham within their attacking ranks, the last of whom has himself gone from scoring 27 goals in 53 games last season to just 7 in 38 so far this term. Nonetheless, even by Roma forward standards, Bellotti's drop-off this season has been dramatically steep, and no goals in 22 league games, when he should be at the peak of his powers, earns him a spot in my seven. Fifth, Patrick Schick. It is perhaps easy with forwards to pinpoint when they are having good or bad seasons, simply by looking at their number of goal contributions, which might be why there are so many of them in this seven. But I've only included forwards who aren't just struggling to score goals this season, but have had miserable seasons all round. There are a few finer examples of that than Patrick Schick, a man who was on top of the world last season, as he scored 24 goals in just 27 games for Bayer Leverkusen in the Bundesliga, fresh off the back of having been the joint highest scorer at Euro 2020, tied with Cristiano Ronaldo. Indeed, if it wasn't for injuries, which ruled him out of 13 league games last season, Schick could have rivaled Robert Lewandowski for the Bundesliga Golden Boot. Even with those setbacks, he still managed to outscore Erling Haaland. One thing has been the same for Schick this season as last, he has struggled with injuries, but very little else. In the 23 games that he has played this season, he has only managed to score four goals, and he also registered just a solitary assist in all competitions, compared to five last season. Recurring issues relating to the adductor muscles in his inner thigh, which is the problem currently sidelining him, certainly haven't helped. But even when fit, there are now question marks around whether Schick has done enough to merit a starting berth. Quick, six foot three inches tall, and really technically gifted, it's not the first time that this has happened. Schick also scored just eight goals in 58 games and was labelled a flop after joining Roma for a club record-breaking fee in 2017, and now some are begging the question as to whether last season was just a flash in the pan. I'm not convinced that is the case, but clearly, he is someone who has purple patches of form, needs to be playing with confidence, and even more importantly, needs to stay fit and this season, he has been sorely lacking on all three fronts. The consequence for Bayer Leverkusen has been a fall from finishing third in the Bundesliga last season to eighth this season as things currently stand. Fourth, Charles de Quetelara. One of the most sought-after centre-forwards in European football last summer, chuck a rock at clubs who signed up to join the European Super League, and odds are that you'd hit one that wanted to sign Charles de Quetelara. That is unsurprising, perhaps, given his billing as the next big thing to come out of Belgian football, a country which has produced so much talent over the last couple of decades. 
aged 20 and 21 last season, De Ketelara made 28 goal contributions in 49 games for Club Bruges, as well as catching the eye against the likes of Manchester City and PSG in the Champions League. Clever, creative, and hardworking, De Ketelara is a 6 foot 4 inch playmaker who had a penchant not just for creating goals, but for scoring them as well. And he looked equally impressive when deployed on the left, right, up front, or in attacking midfield. It was AC Milan who won the race to sign De Catalara for a fee of 35 million euros, but things haven't quite worked out for either party just yet. That is putting things rather kindly, given that De Catalara has so far failed to score a single goal and has registered just one assist, at home to Bologna, in 31 games and 1,241 minutes of football for AC Milan. Capped 11 times by Belgium, De Ketelara just turned 22, and it is worth reminding ourselves that someone like Rafael Liao also took a little bit of time to get up to speed in Syria. However, Liao had shown a level of promise by this stage which De Ketelara simply hasn't as of yet, and for a league and club that are no longer swimming in cash, 35 million euros is a fee which means some will demand immediate results. De Ketelara hasn't yet been able to produce them, and nor, it should be said, has Divock Origi, who has arguably been even less impressive, despite scoring two goals to De Ketelara's zero. The end result is an AC Milan side that has gone from winning the Scudetto last season to one that sits fourth right now, a whopping 23 points behind runaway league leaders Napoli. Third, Trent Alexander-Arnold. Few players are as maligned and as acclaimed as Trent Alexander-Arnold, and rarely are both so often justified. An era-defining fullback when Liverpool were at their best, I don't think that it is unreasonable to suggest. No fullback has produced as many assists in a top European league since records began as Alexander-Arnold did between 2018 and 2022. In those four seasons alone, Alexander-Arnold made 59 assists, an average of 15 a season, and last season was actually his most prolific of the lot, as he registered a remarkable 19 assists. There are few forwards in world football who have put up numbers like that on such a consistent basis, let alone fullbacks. Throughout that time, though, question marks surrounding Alexander-Arnold's defensive capabilities have never gone away, particularly in terms of his positioning and awareness, and I don't think that anyone could argue with the fact that the way in which Liverpool played throughout that period was almost tailor-made to maximise his strengths and minimise his weaknesses. This season, however, it is Alexander-Arnold's strengths that have been diminished. He has registered just three assists in all competitions over 36 games, his lowest tally since the 2017-18 season, when he was just 19, and brutally exposed his defensive frailties, as Liverpool have had one of the leakiest defences in the Premier League. That has been masked somewhat by Alisson's continued fine form, but Liverpool have already conceded three more goals this season than they did during the entirety of last season in the Premier League, not to mention that humiliating five-goal haul that Real Madrid put past them in the space of just 46 Champions League minutes. It would be ridiculous to suggest that Alexander-Arnold is solely responsible for that, but no player has been so consistently poor in what has been a disastrous campaign for the club, and coming down from such a high base, there's no way that he couldn't make my top three. Second, Raul de Tomas. Capped four times by Spain last season, whilst playing out of his skin for Espanyol, it was just a year ago that some were suggesting that Raul de Tomas could replace Alvaro Morata and come up with the answers to Spain's ongoing centre-forward problems. 12 months on, now some people are questioning whether the real Raul de Tomas was actually killed last season, and the person now pretending to be him has never played professional football before, and is just wearing his skin as a suit. Alright, it is only me questioning whether that is the case, but he has been really bad. A graduate of the La Fabrica youth ranks at Real Madrid, De Tomas only ever made one appearance in Madrid's first team before making a 20 million euro move to Benfica. 
Three goals in 17 games for Benfica, none of which came in the league, somehow preceded another 20 million euro move, this time in a club record-breaking deal to Espanyol, almost doubling the club's previous record. In his first half season in Catalonia, De Tomas could only manage four goals and was powerless to prevent the club from getting relegated. But no one scored more goals than him in the Segunda Division the following season, as his 23 goals fired Espanyol back into the top flight. Last season, De Tomas proved that he wasn't just a flat track bully, scoring 17 goals and making three assists in 34 league games, including goals against Atletico Madrid, Barcelona, and his former club Real Madrid, without which Espanyol certainly would have been relegated. Over the summer, Rayo Vallecano, where Tomas previously scored prolifically on loan from Real Madrid, thought that they had got themselves a bargain, picking De Tomas up, who is only 27 years old, for a fee reported to have been just 8 million euros. For the third highest scorer in La Liga last season, tied with Vinicius Jr., ostensibly heading into his prime years, it seemed like a no-brainer. Unfortunately, at this moment in time, De Tomas seems more like a no-talenter. The move got off to a stupid start to begin with, since De Tomas joined Rayo after the transfer window had shut in September, which meant that he couldn't be registered in the league until January. Since he has been registered, he has failed to score or assist a single goal in eight games, though he has only played 255 minutes of football. Some rustiness, given his enforced spell on the sidelines, is to be expected, but last weekend, in 33 minutes after coming off the bench, he saw just eight touches of the ball, had one shot off target, and only completed one of the four passes that he attempted. So, not great. First, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. There is falling from grace, and then there's Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. A man whose stock has fallen so hard this season that even Deli Ali is asking if he's alright. One of the most prolific goalscorers in Europe for more than a decade, Aubameyang had an acrimonious exit from Arsenal midway through last season, but even then he had scored 7 goals in 15 games up to that point when he left, and 92 in 163 for the Gunners in total. At Barcelona, and particularly in La Liga, Aubameyang was even more prolific, finding the back of the net 11 times in 17 La Liga outings, and 13 times in 23 games in all competitions. Despite his fine form during that time, Barcelona's financial woes, combined with the arrival of Robert Lewandowski, meant that they were willing to offload Aubameyang for a cut price of just 12 million euros to Chelsea, on summer transfer deadline day, who had a striking problem of their own in light of Romelu Lukaku's loan move to Inter Milan. Aubameyang hasn't just been underwhelming at Chelsea, he has barely played. Uncharacteristically wasteful, he has only scored one goal in 12 Premier League outings, which came against Crystal Palace on his debut. No goals and no assists have followed in the Premier League, with Aubameyang yet to play a full 90 minutes for Chelsea in any competition, and little reason to believe that he ever will. In Chelsea's last seven games, since January reinforcements were made, Aubameyang has only made the bench twice, and he has played a grand total of just seven minutes of football. That is, one minute per game. Hashtag quick maths. Aubameyang returned to Barcelona for El Clasico last weekend, paying a visit to the Barcelona dressing room without Chelsea's permission. There are now reports that Chelsea are looking to terminate Aubameyang's contract, just as happened at Arsenal, and last month he was spotted playing five-a-side in Milan. This is one of the highest paid forwards in world football, who is still only 33 years old, in case anyone needed reminding. Where next for Aubameyang is anyone's guess, really, though moves to the MLS and Western Asia have both been touted. That is it for today's video, though. Dishonourable mentions do go to Jamie Vardy, Jed Spence, Romelu Lukaku, Divock Origi, Moussa Dembele, Luis Muriel, Fabian Ruiz, Mark Kukurea, Calvin Phillips, Gianluca Scamacca, Paul Pogba, Yannick Carrasco, and Dimitri Payet, among many others. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. 
Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on, of course. As if you wouldn't already by this, by this stage. For both HITC7s and my backup channel, both of which should be on your screens now. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram, if that is your kind of thing, via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.